Welcome to Breast Practices. I'm your host, Jennifer Douglas. I'm an author, breast cancer patient advocate, and stage zero DCIS breast cancer survivor. I'm delighted to be here as your host today at Breast Practices. And I'm here welcoming Dr. Randy Miles and uh, Diane Samard. Both of you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Miles serves as the Chief of Breast Imaging at Denver Health with oversight over the Breast Division's clinical research and educational programs. He also serves as the Associate Director for the Radiology Department. Dr. Miles, would you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, as you stated, I'm Dr. Randy Miles. I'm a radiologist who specializes in breast imaging. Uh, that means I read mammograms, breast ultrasound, and breast MRI, and I perform breast procedures in each of those imaging techniques. Uh, I was born in a rural town in North Carolina named Green Level, which has a total population of about 3,000 people now, probably. Um, and that was where I was inspired to treat breast cancer patients after I saw the barriers to care that my grandmother faced uh, when she was being treated for cancer. I remember as a, a kid deciding at that point that I wanted to provide high quality care and reassurance for women facing a cancer diagnosis. So another 10 year old kid or 11 year old kid did not have to watch a close family member suffer or die prematurely uh, from cancer. Um, in terms of my training, I completed medical school at Mayo Clinic and obtained my public health degree at Harvard Medical School at Harvard School of Public Health. I believe that all women, no matter how much money they make, their racial or ethnic background or primary language, deserve the highest level of care. And that is my focus as the chief of uh, breast imaging at Denver Health to focus on these uh, important principles. Dr. Miles, thank you so much for telling us um, how you got into radiology and your inspiration. And um, we thank you for what you're doing for us because it, um, it makes a difference um, to all of us. So thank you. So Diane is a psycho-oncology influencer, a messaging strategist to senior business executives, an award-winning author, a national speaker on business and survivorship, and an advocate to bring more attention to the psychological trauma caused by cancer. Dan, I'm delighted to welcome you here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, absolutely, Jennifer. Thank you so much. So like Dr. Miles, I'm in the Denver, Colorado area. And eight years ago, I was diagnosed with stage 3C breast cancer, uh, one of the biggest shocks of my life. I likely had breast cancer for several years. My tumors were very small, so they were very hard to identify. And it was during um, uh, the end or near the end of chemotherapy that I started to cycle into depression. I, I was very concerned that I was never going to feel good again. And so I asked my medical oncologist for a referral to uh, a therapist that, as I said, understood what it was like for someone like me to want to believe she was in control, but knowing that I wasn't in control and, and I just didn't know how to get good at cancer. And so she said she didn't know of any therapists who specialize in working with cancer patients. And she admitted, she goes, I know they exist. I just don't know of any. So anyway, fast forward, uh, I had a relationship with the University of Denver. So I met with some of the great folks there and actually ended up seed funding and founding a specialty within their graduate school of professional psychology. These are clinical psychologists called the Center for Oncology Psychology Excellence or COPE. And so then um, my life raft af actually out of cancer, as I call it, was writing, writing my book about my, my breast cancer experience and how COPE came to be and why I am such uh, an advocate and so passionate about, as I say, intersecting mental health and cancer. Well, thank you. I um, I was doing some research for our episode and came across everything you're doing. And so I know what I'm adding to um, my reading list um, for the rest of the summer, because that too is something I was shocked about. You know, I, I thought I, I had stage zero and I was really impacted psychologically with um, the diagnosis and the aftermath and, you know, worry that I, and anxiety that I never experienced before. So it's an area of concern and um, thank you for everything you're doing to support us after um, our active treatment ends. Of course. And thank you again for inviting me here today to speak about it. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit. I have a few questions for you guys. Um, so 
Dr. Miles, radiologists have a key role in the imaging and the diagnosis process with regard to, as you said, performing imaging, um, recommending further procedures, perhaps um, performing some biopsies. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how radiologists are being trained to talk to patients as we're both dealing with these procedures and, and um, waiting for our results? So communication skills are critical in the field of radiology, particularly in breast imaging. Uh, we're usually the first person to let a woman know that uh, she may need either additional imaging or a biopsy. And we're typically the first person to give those results that um, she, and, and I'll say he as well, because some men develop breast cancer, but the first one to um, let patients know that they have a cancer diagnosis. I would say in the past, doctors had to really learn these soft skills on their own or to be naturally empathetic, to be competent in this area. But I would say, um, you know, as time has moved on, we are seeing more and more medical schools and residency training programs focus on patient communication as a part of their curriculum. Um, you know, that's one of my favorite lectures to give is to talk about patient communication. How do you have these conversations with patients to make sure that um, they are, they feel that they are the priority at that point as they're dealing with uh, receiving this uh, challenging and difficult uh, news. Um, I will, I will point out that there are some unique features or unique uh, features to patient provider communication in radiology, specifically with breast imaging. First, we typically have a very limited um, history with the patient and very limited um, interactions. So when I walk into a room or call a patient on the phone about their exam or their results, um, you know, at most typically I've probably interacted with them once or twice before in comparison to a primary care doctor who's, you know, had years and years um, of experience dealing with that patient. Um, second, we typically have a limited time to have these critical uh, converse, conversations. So due to these challenges, it, it's something that I've developed this model named PEER um, to really help me communicate uh, with patients. And, uh, and patients really are our peers. You know, we're working together uh, to ensure that they have the uh, best outcome. Um, and, you know, PEER for me, it stands for prioritizing explaining, empathizing, and building rapport. And when I say prioritize, I wanna make sure that, that patient feels as comfortable as possible before we start having these difficult conversations. I um, wanna make sure I'm engaging in active listening and asking open-ended questions to ensure that the patient um, is able to relay any information um, that they feel is important to relay and be able to ask questions comfortably. I want to explain um, in a way that the patient understands that it's honest, direct, and honest and direct communication. Uh, I don't want to leave any room for confusion when uh, giving these, uh, giving, um, you know, providing information about either their exam, biopsy, or results. And I want to make sure I avoid jargon and have complementary resources and tools that help relay the, me the message that I'm trying to relay. Um, the second E is empathizing, acknowledging that, acknowledging and validating the patient's emotions, under, understanding that this could be a very difficult interaction. So I want to make sure that I'm letting the patient lead and, and responding to their needs and offering hope when appropriate. And then last, the R out of, for peer for the acronym, just building that rapport. You know, we have a limited amount of time, but just because there is a limited amount of time for these conversations, doesn't mean that you can't make that patient leave that conversation feel like they were um, listened to, make sure that they understand, you know, the aspects of their diagnosis, that it's important for them to understand at that time and make sure that they can leave that conversation knowing that there is a plan that they're going to receive the best care possible. Well, I am. Um... I really appreciate you sharing this, the peer method with us. Um, and I completely relate. I've had many brief conversations with radiologists, but I've also, they have been impactful. And I can tell that a radiologist is, you know, really listening to me. And I may never see that particular provider again, but if I've had the opportunity to get my questions answered and to ask about the next steps, I feel heard and then I can move on with what I need to. And so thank you for everything that you're doing and talking um, 
about educating radiologists in our patient care. Thank you. Um, so Diane and Dr. Miles, there's often anxiety, as you might imagine, during biopsies and imaging. I experience it every time I walk through the same doors and go into that same mammogram room where they took the mammogram that diagnosed my cancer. Um, and so, um, Diane, do you have, um, can you share some ideas for uh, patients, um, for us, so that we can walk through these feelings of anxiety? Because we all, we need to follow up. We can't just run away and, and um, not go to our appointments. So talk to me about some ideas that you have for us. Certainly. And I echo and, and thank Dr. Miles as far as, 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 um, his beliefs and what he teaches and trains because being able to communicate effectively is, and, and, and with empathy is so important. Um, from a, a patient perspective, be sure to ask those clarification questions and, and perhaps even more important than that to, to um, disclose as you are able that you're feeling anxious or nervous or fear um, so, so that your doctor can understand really where your frame of mind is at. And, and so much of that is, is important for those of us receiving these services to just make sure that, that, that the person that's doing this procedure understands where you're at. And I know that may not be comfortable disclosing that, but it really is so important. And, and again, in addition to that, things that I, I certainly did was focus on breathing, um, and, one, one thing at a time, asking those clarification questions and then, and then following up and, and just, you know, what comes next? I'm, I'm one of those that needs to understand what's going to happen next. Who will I hear from next? How long will it be? If that information is important to you, make little notes, um, have your questions down on a piece of paper and bring those with you. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's so much to think about. And, and that really is why I appreciate so much uh, the attention that continues to, as I say, evolve that's being put on the frame of mind, the fear, and all of those emotions that understandably happen when you're in that situation. I, I, I have made it a practice definitely to communicate, hey, I'm feeling anxious, or I, you know, I have had a, this type of experience with a biopsy, and it helps. I can, I can actually sometimes see the medical team pivot their perspective in real time to understand that, oh, this is a patient who's had a previous experience with X and they're going, they, I can see them adjust and it's really neat to see that happen in real time. Dr. Miles, do you have any ideas um, for us as patients? Because you see, I have my experience, but you see, you see many of us all throughout the day. So I, I'd love um, for you to share any ideas you might have for patients going into these procedures. Yeah, first I'll say it. I, I I echo everything that Diane said. I think she gave some really great uh, points. And I just, as a radiologist, just want to say you are the priority during these conversations. So just make sure that you're comfortable, um, you know, when you're receiving this information. Um, and that was as was stated before. If you need to write questions down before, or if you need to bring in a pen and pad to write down notes during these conversations. Make sure to do that. If you need to, if you need the doctor to kind of hold on so you can get prepared, let the doctor know because um, you are the priority. I will say it also can be helpful as you're having these conversations to have a, either a family member or friend with you. You know, when you do receive these type of, you know, this type of news, sometimes, you know, it's hard to really focus in on what the doctor is saying. So having a family member or friend that you trust that can kind of fill in those gaps that you may miss. Uh, due to hearing, you know, the news that, you know, that you may be receiving. Um, I love the the comment of, of about of breathing. I think that's great advice to first breathe and then, you know, just take it one step at a time. And I think it's okay to know the next steps or when you're going to uh, receive uh, your results. But um, I would say try to, fo to not focus on the what ifs, you know, for example, when a doctor recommends additional imaging, you don't have a cancer diagnosis yet. So try to focus on the fact that, you know, I need this additional imaging so they can further evaluate this finding. It doesn't mean that I have cancer. And the same thing with the biopsy. When we recommend a biopsy, um, you know, we just need additional, we need that tissue just to look at the cells to see if breast cancer is present. It doesn't mean you have a cancer diagnosis. 
Um, in fact, the majority of the patients that we call back for additional imaging and the majority of biopsies we perform, we perform actually do not come back as cancers. So try not to take the full weight um, that you're, you have a breast cancer diagnosis before someone tells you the results that you have a breast cancer diagnosis. I think it really helps um, you to kind of go through the process um, in a little bit less um, anxiety provoking manner if you're able to kind of take each step and to digest each step um, as you go through it. That's really, really great advice. And, um, you know, I've had I, I've had so many biopsies I've lost track, but only one of them has actually been cancer. Um, I hate them all. They're, they're, I'm not a fan, but it is, it is important to, to recognize where you are in that, that steps of the process. And, you know, as we're walking through additional imaging and biopsies, one of the things we deal with is uncertainty. And so, um, Diane, what do you think about how how do you deal with the uncertainty? You talked about how you like to know you're in control, and I'm curious as you've worked in this field, um, how have your perspectives changed? What do you do to manage that uncertainty? Yeah, I'm I I'm one that needs the information, and not not everyone is like that. I, I have a a background in print journalism, so I'm always asking why. And, and data and information is it brings me comfort as bizarre as that may sound but I I uh, have actually learned to apply some things I've learned as opposed to my passion for what it is that I advocate for and and that is I've just learned to write down my worries and and to not carry those with me and then set aside worry time and this is this is a strategy that, that some therapists are actually advising their clients to, to consider doing because, uh, okay, I need to research this or get an answer to this, but I don't have to carry it around with me all day. So just put it in your notes in your phone or write it down, however you do that, but set aside time to make sure that, that you pursue answers to that. And um, again, because I have this, this um, trait in me where information brings me comfort. Not everyone is like that. And that's another point in all of that is this is such a unique experience for each one of us. Um, at times it, you can feel commoditized. I know I did, but that's, uh, to me, it was just all of these emotions that were just building and, you know, my situation's different and unique and I'm me and I do things differently my, my own way. So I appreciate what Dr. Miles said about encouraging those on our care teams to see us as uh, individuals and, and we each have unique triggers and anxieties. Some may not even have anything to do with cancer. Some may be surfacing. This is as uh, research has shown that this does occur. Past traumas do tend to surface during uh, a cancer experience and, and, and perhaps even before you even get a diagnosis. So it's complex. It, it absolutely is. And I'm um, dealing with that uncertainty. And Dr. Miles, you, you have to communicate um, in ways that, you know, you guys, you may not always know the answers. And so how do you as a radiologist manage that uncertainty as you're, as you're talking to patients? Definitely. I, I usually let the patient lead, you know, I, I, as Diane mentioned, there's certain uh, patients who want to know everything and want to know that information. It's important that I provide that information um, in a way that's digestible, but to also make sure that I'm, you know, not being as straightforward and honest as, as possible so that, that they can, you know, have those questions answered. There are other patients who are a little bit less focused on the actual information and results, but who really want that comfort. So I'm really letting the patient lead and I'm kind of support supporting them in the best way uh, possible. That that sounds like a something that you need to do on a on a patient by patient basis. And thanks for being um, receptive and understanding what we need at the time. Uh, so as a part of our breast practices, I love to ask my guests, um, what are your top three resources um, that you might recommend um, for someone coping with a possible or actual breast cancer diagnosis? So Diane, do you have any resources you'd like to share with us? 
Absolutely. And one of my favorites is actually an online magazine called Breast Cancer Wellness. And uh, you can subscribe for, for free. Just go to their website, which is breastcancerwellness.org. The publisher is, is actually one of my mentors and a dear friend of mine, Beverly Vote, who went through her breast cancer experience over three decades ago. And so my how things have changed, but her outcome was that she really wants to, to focus on sort of the patient-centered experience. And so she has devoted her the rest of her career to this topic. And, and um, she's one of the most um, boy, humanistic and deeply centered people that I know. And I, I very much respect her. Another resource, uh, many of us women um, have uh, dense breast tissue, which has also um, become uh, more uh, there's been more awareness about that recently. And another good friend of mine, um, Le Leslie Ferris Yeager, founded a, a wonderful group called My Density Matters. And their website is mydensitymatters.org. A lot of great resources um, and, and not just information, by the way, they're doing a lot with policy, which is so important from those of us who deal with this and just a great information and support uh, support network. Those are great resources. Thank you so much for sharing. Dr. Miles, do you have any resources you'd like to share with our audience? Definitely. Um, first of all, just to echo, um, Leslie Ferris is great. I've actually worked with her as well. So definitely uh, would recommend that website um, in terms of finding out more information about dense breast tissue. Um, also, densebreast.info.org. They provide a lot of great information uh, as well. Um, you know, I think these websites are great because a lot, they, a lot of times they provide information that are directly, you know, there's the evidence or the medical aspect of it, but there's also information from patients who have actually gone through the entire breast cancer continuum experience that can provide insight about their experience. Um, the, one of the main resources I'll say is you're a radiologist, you know, when you go into uh, see your, for your mammogram, if you have questions or anything about uh, anything about like breast cancer screening dense breast tissue the breast imaging radiologist who's reading your exam you know really has experience in answering those questions that can make you feel more comfortable about you know these topics um you know what screening regimen you're on whether you're on one or two years they can provide some insight um about those type of um issues. So I would say reach out to your breast imaging radiologist if you do have questions and also the breast imaging center. Um, you know, we have a lot of resources that we can provide, not just on breast cancer and the medical portion of it, but, um, you know, we actually have some resources that we can provide in terms of, you know, if you are diagnosed with breast cancer, how do you have that challenging conversation with small kids? Or how do you, um, you know, there's mental health resources that we can kind of direct you to. And a lot of centers have these uh, type of resources, but, um, you know, it may not be outwardly like advertised. So, you know, if you do seek these type of resources, you know, engage your uh, breast imaging center uh, to see if they can provide these. A lot of these resources are free of charge or offer a discount um, rate. Uh, the last thing I would say is just reputable websites. There's a lot of information online. So when you are, you know, Googling or putting um, certain um, topics in a search engine, just make sure you're going to, you know, I would focus in on reputable clinics and hospitals. You know, we offer a lot of information on our website at Denver Health on breast imaging. I think it's helpful, but there's other hospitals, there's Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic who have so much, um, you know, helpful um, information on breast cancer and, and different aspects of breast, um, breast care. Those are wonderful resources. And thank you both for sharing them. And um, I've learned, I always learn something when I do these interviews about new resources. Um, so I'm curious um, about what both of you are doing in the future for the breast cancer community. So Diane, would you like to share things that you're working on right now? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I echo Dr. Miles, care centers, breast care centers are evolving and offering these mental health services and it just warms my heart. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, again, I've found that uh, survivors do reach out to me because 
they don't really know where to start. And so what I try to do and will continue to be doing in the future is to, to view um, a, a certainly a, a, a trauma like a breast cancer diagnosis or even the trauma that leads up to um, results uh, if, if you don't have breast cancer, which is a good thing, certainly, but, but how to channel that and, and to focus and lean into that. And so my next writing project actually is a book about um, coming back from emotional trauma. Uh, I talk a lot about, uh, have a lot of stories about cancer, but there's other things that are traumatic, like um, success and failure with weight loss, for example. And so uh, that book's going to be out in September. So it's kind of uh, the theme for me this year. It's about healing forward um, and, and channeling, transforming your emotional scars into impact. And so uh, there's so many wonderful organizations and, and books like yours, Jennifer, that have been written as a result of, uh, and are such a phenomenal resource to, to those who, who, appreciate hearing about this experience from someone who's been through it. And so I continue to be uh, as, as open and raw and honest as I can be, but certainly optimistic. I think there is reason the, um, the process of, of diagnosing, identifying, treating breast cancer continues to evolve and, and certainly improve in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And, I, and I'm very much grateful for that and thankful for, again, the medical staff, like like Dr. Miles and, and, and what Molly Surgical is doing to offer these types of resources and candid conversations. We can't have enough of it. Um, we, we need a lot more of it. I totally agree. And I am, cannot wait for your book because just recently I've had a slew of people coming to me and talking to me about you know, the emotional trauma and the aftermath. And it's just been this theme. And I went on Google, I was like, okay, is there a book out there? Should I write another book? Turns out you're writing a book. So I'm going to read that. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Miles, um, would you share a little bit about what you're doing um, in addition to practicing radiology and teaching the peer methodology for our community? Definitely. Um, you know, I think on the medical side, like most to, you know, most breast imaging centers. Um, uh, similarly here at Denver Health, we have the latest technology, including the 3D breast imaging, the breast MRI and all that, but I'm really focusing on getting back to the basics and focusing on the three C's and that's like comfort, compassion, and convenience. And I think that's where a lot of needed, a lot of centers really need to center um, in on and focusing on the patient. You know, one of the big things that I've really focusing on our uh, divisions, making sure we pay that extra attention to make sure the patient has the most comfortable experience from what they see in the waiting rooms to trying to create a seamless check-in process. Um, you know, like we've kind of alluded to before, when you enter that breast imaging center, it's very anxiety provoking. You know, you, 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 know, you don't know if you're, you're gonna leave with either a recommendation for additional imaging or procedure or whether or not you may have breast cancer. So we wanna make sure that we make that experience as comfortable as possible. Um, we are also starting to offer same day biopsies uh, to really focus on convenience. We know women are busy, um, you know, have jobs, school, family, and other responsibilities. So when you hear that you have a recommendation for a biopsy, you wanna make sure that you don't necessarily have to take another day off work or to find someone to care uh, for, uh, you know, a, for your for an elderly family member or for a child, um, and we also want to make sure we limit any barriers um, to anyone coming back or returning for that that biopsy. And I know we've talked a lot about anxiety, but we also want to limit the anxiety because when you have to wait a few days or a week in or anticipating that biopsy um, or wait longer from when you have that recommendation to receive receiving your results. Um, you know, that really can just multiply. So we want to limit that as well. And, and we've actually, um, you know, I'm really proud to say this. We've had, you know, some women um, within our division who have had that breast cancer diagnosis and who have had surgery within two weeks, just because we really tried to streamline this process and to make sure that, you know, if there is a diagnosis that we're going to provide the best care, um, not in terms of the quality, but also in terms of efficiency and making sure that, you know, we can get you to the next step as quickly as possible. So you can move on and focus in on those important things in life, like, you know, yourself and then family and enjoying life. So. 
Well, those, those all sound um, amazing. I know my anxiety would definitely increase as I was waiting, for, going from imaging to imaging to biopsy and then to results. And so if we can shorten that duration, then we can get to the next step um, sooner. And so thank you for working. And, and it's a, imagine it's a very big administrative process to make sure that all of the teams are working together. So thank you for doing that. Um, Diane and Dr. Miles, um, thank you so much for joining us here today on Breast Practices. I, it was a delight to speak with you both, and um, thank you for what you are doing for uh, the breast cancer community. Thank you so much, Jennifer. The work you're doing is amazing. I just want to, I don't know if I've said it before, I just want to point it out before we closed out. And Diane, same thing, like I'm really excited about your focus because I do think, you know, mental health has really, um, I don't think we put as much attention as we should have in the past. And I think it's growing, but the, I think the work that you're doing is really gonna help amplify that and show the importance of it, so. Well, well thank you so much. And, and I am so grateful for, again, the work that all of you do. And um, I feel encouraged um, that we are going to uh, continue to better manage by listening, by addressing, um, because I always say the brain is part of the body and, and paying attention to our mental health really, and, and research is showing this, has an impact physically on our body's ability to heal itself. So it is so important. So thank you again. It was fabulous to, uh, to be on, uh, on this call today.